Um, I just wanted to remind everyone that if you weren't able to submit a question at the time of registration, you can always open up the chat section, which is available at the bottom of the screen and type a question and it'll come up on the right hand side. And then that way uh, I can make Kyle aware that we received a question in the chat and we can discuss that one as well. Um, so if anyone wanted to do that, you can go ahead with that as well. We have factored in some time to pick out some other questions as well. Um, so the next question that we had at the time of registration came from a constituent named Nikki. Um, Nikki raised some questions with regards to pensions for seniors. Um, I know that there's, uh, there was a lot of confusion going on during COVID and seniors getting additional funding and Kyle spoke about this many times before. Um, so she wanted to know, um, I guess, Kyle's thoughts on the raise in pension for seniors at this time. Yeah, I think that one of the things we, we look at is uh, seniors are eligible for CPP, uh, OAS, which is old age security, um, and uh, GIS, which is the Guaranteed Income Supplement. All of these do not provide enough money for our seniors. And the government has offered a one-time COVID payment to seniors uh, that is going to increase uh, what they get. I think it was 500 or $600. Uh, now, I acknowledge that is something for our seniors while they're going through COVID-19. Uh, but what we've seen right now is the government is willing to spend money uh, to help all kinds of people, whether it's through CERB, uh, which is the uh, emergency relief benefit, uh, or whether it's through the wage subsidy. Uh, so to me, the time is come uh, to increase the money that we give to seniors. Uh, seniors are the people that built this country. Uh, they worked very hard and uh, we owe them a debt of gratitude. And that debt of gratitude uh, should be uh, that they are actually given an amount of money that they can comfortably live on. And if somebody is only receiving OAS and GIS, uh, they do not uh, have an income that is above the poverty line uh, in this country. And to me, it's a real shame that we have seniors that are living in poverty after they've contributed so much, especially in a country that is as uh, successful uh, as Canada is. So, uh, I certainly spoke out on the, the money that was delivered to seniors was slow. Uh, you know, I, I called out the prime minister and the government several times saying, why does it take three months to deliver this money? And that it's not enough. It has now been delivered, but uh, we have to make sure that we find ways to make sure that our seniors have the kind of money they need uh, to be able to live uh, at a decent standard of living uh, in their retirement. So. Um, Nikki, uh, if you're on the call, thanks so much for the question, uh, and uh, hopefully that, that answers it. Okay, great. Thanks, Kyle. Um, actually, I've just noticed that we got a question typed in the chat from Julia. Um, I'm just going to read it out for you here, Kyle. The federal deficit is expected to hit $343 billion this year, and the federal debt load to hit $1.2 trillion. Is there a plan for Canada's economic recovery after this record spending by the federal government? Well, I think, I think the, the government has spent a lot of money in $343 billion. Uh, it's, it's helped us in the sense that uh, we are really doing well in the fight against COVID-19. So I, I, don't, I don't really criticize the fact that they've spent $343 billion. I think, uh, yes, it's a lot. Uh, and maybe they, they've spent, their, you know, we've all heard reports that uh, the Canadian Emergency uh, Relief Benefit, people have accessed it that shouldn't have. And uh, there's been perhaps some wasteful spending there. The real big issue for me is that uh, in the, over the last five years uh, prior to, um, prior to COVID-19, uh, the federal government ran a deficit of approximately $78 billion. So they added $78 billion of debt uh, during the good years when the economy was going very well and when there wasn't a crisis. And now to add an additional $343 billion, what's happened is uh, our credit as a country has now been downgraded. We're the only G7 country that has had their credit downgraded as a result of borrowing uh, through COVID-19. And that's directly related to the $78 billion of debt uh, that was racked up in the previous five years when the economy was good. I don't know about other people, but um, 
you know, the old saying, you know, make hay while the sun shines. And in those five years, when we were having good economic times, we should have been paying down debt. Uh, that in that, that's what in 2015, uh, the government, the, the previous government, the conservative government left a budgetary surplus. And they were on track to continue those surpluses and use that money to pay down debt. Uh, unfortunately, we went the other direction. And when you think about it, uh, we had a, a, a federal debt of around $600 billion uh, before uh, the Liberal government uh, came in in 2015. We're now over a trillion dollars. So for the entire 153 years it took to rack up, bring out the debt up to about $600 billion, we've almost doubled it, uh, a little over a billion uh, in the last six years. And this is debt that's going to be very difficult. Uh, for the ne our next generations to uh, to have to pay down. And servicing of the interest on that debt is going to be significant. It's going to be tens of billions of dollars a year that we're going to be paying. It's like when you, you know, max out your credit card and your minimum monthly payments go way up. That is uh, kind of where we are now with the debt. And I think we needed better fiscal responsibility in those previous five years. Tough, uh, tough stuff for us right now. Okay, great. Thanks, Kyle. Um, we all, I also received a message uh, going back to the original question that was about the rural internet. Um, Michael is here um, under the name Christine. So I'm going to ask technical support to unmute Christine Thompson. And then uh, Michael has some follow up questions on the rural internet topic, if you're okay with that, Kyle. Yep, that's great. Okay, Michael, I think you're unmuted now, so go ahead. Hi, thank you. Um, so I appreciate Kyle's uh, feedback and uh, with regards to uh, making internet uh, a priority for, for us here in, in rural Caledon. Um, my, my question, I, I guess my, my follow-up question or my second part of that question would be, is, is there any um, expectation or, or thoughts around a timeline for, for making that a reality. Um, obviously, the, uh, the the challenges of of living in a in a in a higher cost area with with higher property taxes and and even so far as paying a, a broadband levy, um, although the the levy itself isn't uh, astronomical by any means, but it'll it'll come down to the to the principle of it. Um, I, I I previously lived about eight minutes. Um, North of here in, in Simcoe County, with um, lower housing costs, lower property taxes, and, and blazing fast internet. So I, um, you know, not trying to so much make a comparison of the two, um, but uh, is there a roadmap available on 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 timelines for 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 making that a reality here? Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Michael. Thanks for the follow up. I think I think the challenge right now is that uh, the current government has a formula that they're trying to follow, and and that timeline is 2030. Uh, and I'm I'm not confident they're going to meet that timeline of 2030, given they haven't met any of the benchmarks uh, in the previous five years. You talked about a um, uh, a, a like a, a broadband surtax, I think, and I don't think I'm using the right term there. A, a broadband levy municipally. Um, one of the things that we call for in our rethink of how we're doing uh, rural broadband is to actually allow municipalities to become uh, part owners of the infrastructure. So they could actually partner with some of the businesses that want to expand broadband uh, in, for example, in Caledon or anywhere in Dufferin. And that's part of our program. It's actually all available. And if anybody here is, is on the call and you're interested in actually reading our policy document, it's not too long. It's only about 12 pages. It, it talks about a lot of new and innovative ways that we want to uh, quickly uh, enhance uh, rural broadband. Our plan is to have uh, rural broadband across Canada in five years. Uh, so if you're interested, uh, after this call, um, please uh, send, send an email uh, to kyle.cback at parl.gc.ca and I will send you off a copy of our uh, rural broadband policy paper that I think actually can make a difference. I think we really do need a paradigm shift on this. 
the old system of what we're doing is not working. These one-off little fundings uh, that we're giving to large telecom companies really has not expanded broadband service in rural communities. And we have to move away from that model. And I think what we're looking at is very innovative, very different, and will actually have a different outcome. Thanks for that, Kyle. Um, I'm actually going to put it now to um, Aaron, who I believe asked a question at the time of registration. I know we were hopeful that the mayor might be on in time to answer your question because I think it might be a little bit more municipally geared, but I'm sure Kyle would still be thrilled to hear what you have to say. So I'm going to ask technical support to unmute uh, Aaron Willoughby, please. Okay. Hi, sorry. I, uh, I'm actually trying to put a baby to sleep while I'm listening to this town hall. So I, I don't know if you have my original question there. Yep. Yep. That's no problem. I can just read it out. No problem. Okay, sorry. I'm just trying to listen along. That's no. okay. That's okay. Um, of course. Good luck. Good luck getting your baby to sleep. <laughs> Okay, so I'll just go through what Aaron wrote to us, Kyle. So first it was with regards to um, speeding in Bolton, but I think the issue that uh, we might want to talk more about uh, with you is um, the issue of vacant stores in downtown Bolton and if there's uh, any plans or suggestions to bring business. She listed an example that there is a cafe in downtown Bolton that has appeared to be coming soon for two years, uh, but has yet to open. Uh, it seems like there are missed opportunities in our town and there's nothing to be drawing people to it. Is there anything that you can say on that, Kyle? Yeah, well, it, I, think it's, I, I think it's a challenging issue right now, especially uh, during COVID-19 because we're losing uh, some businesses. Uh, all across the riding. I, I hear every week of new businesses that unfortunately are going to have to close. So I think it, it, it might um, might get a little bit worse before it gets better. Not only are it going to be challenging for new stores to move in, we're seeing some uh, existing businesses unfortunately not able to survive during uh, COVID-19. Part of the issue with that has been, from my view, is the very slow way in which we roll, uh, the government rolled out supports for businesses. When the crisis first hit, they uh, offered a 10% wage subsidy. Uh, when other countries around the world were offering 75 and 80%, uh, it took almost a month and a half for the government to realize that a 10% wage subsidy, when you tell a business you have to close down, is not going to allow them to retain employees and stay in business. So then they changed to a 75% wage subsidy and took another very long time to, to roll that out, made the terms and conditions to qualify for the wage subsidy very complicated, such that many businesses uh, could not qualify. And the same thing has happened with the uh, Canadian Emergency Bank account, which is another way that small businesses can access funds. Again, the rules were very complicated, very slow to roll out, and it's a loan as well. It's called an emergency bank account, but in fact, it's a $40,000 loan. Uh, I hear from businesses every week who say they are trying to get these funds uh, through their banking institution and their applications are being rejected. Uh, they don't know why. Uh, they can't get in touch with a government department to figure out which one. They speak to government departments and government departments say, no, 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 we're not involved in that decision. You have to talk to this other government department. So the rollout for business supports has been very poor uh, from my estimation. And that's why we're seeing so many businesses struggling all across the riding. For me, I think what we're going to have to do is find ways to invest in businesses post COVID-19 uh, because even businesses now that are operating with outdoor patios, reduced capacity and other things, uh, their other costs are not being reduced. Uh, they still have their rent to pay. Uh, they may have a mortgage, uh, they have salaries, uh, all kinds of things, and many businesses are struggling. We need to have a transition plan from this government uh, for businesses as we move through the various phases. And that's one thing that we have not seen. The federal government has not put forward any full coherent plan to help transition businesses uh, through COVID into, uh, into reopening. Uh, even now, when you, when you enter, phase, enter phase three, Restaurants can't be packed. Uh, other places uh, can't. Gatherings are limited to 100 people. So many restaurants are still at significantly reduced capacity, uh, and yet they have all of their, their normal costs that go on. Their hydro costs don't go down. 
uh, their gas costs don't go down, all these kinds of things. So we really need this government to step up and deliver a coherent plan to support our businesses as we try and get to where we can completely and fully uh, reopen the economy. Okay, great. Thanks, Kyle. Um, let me just see if we have anything else here that's perfect. Okay, so we had a question from uh, Jennifer Shannon, and this is another one that maybe is a little bit more municipally geared, but I don't know if you might have an input on it. So it's with regards to transportation, um, bringing more transportation to the Bolton area, go buses, trains, those sorts of things. Is there anything that you could speak to with regards to that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's challenging uh, when you deal, when you talk about go transit. Uh, these are, uh, these are, that's a provincial, uh, provincial issue, provincial responsibility. What I, one of the things that I talked about when I campaigned was uh, we need far better transit service uh, all across the riding, especially in Caledon, uh, whether you're, you know, whether you're in Bolton or sort of anywhere else. The lack of transit is a huge a uh, huge problem when we're trying to move people uh, from Bolton down into Brampton, Mississauga, Toronto, and other places where they're working. Uh, I've called for large investments uh, from the provincial government uh, with respect to urban transit. And this is where uh, a government can actually help. They can get involved and partner in those projects. So um, I think we have to play the long game when we're talking about transit. Uh, all levels of government, uh, provincial, federal, and municipal, they all have to say transit is going to be critical, not only for just the quality of life of people living in Dufferin Caledon, but in fact, if we're looking at trying to meet our carbon, uh, carbon emission targets uh, under the Paris Accord, if we don't have large investments in uh, transportation and transit, uh, there's going to be uh, real challenges. So, uh, it's great that go service wasn't stopped uh, to Bolton. I know there was uh, some discussion that that was going to take place. For me with transit, if transit isn't um, affordable, uh, convenient, um, and uh, pleasant, people are going to stay in their cars because they can stay in their cars or trucks. Uh, they've got their personal space. It's comfortable, all of these things. Um, I know myself uh, at one point uh, when I lived in Brampton, I tried to go to work in Toronto and take the GO train. And, uh, and if, if my day finished early, uh, there wasn't a return GO train service. And that goes to convenience. I think much like the old movie with Kevin Costner, Field of Dreams, when they talk about it, if you build it, they will come. If you build a transportation system that uh, is convenient, uh, has lots of options, uh, runs on time, uh, you know, is clean and friendly, all these things, people are going to use transit. And uh, so that is, that is my pledge, uh, that all three levels of government have to come together to make large investments in, uh, in transit. Uh, and, you know, Caledon deserves to have, and Bolton in particular, uh, they deserve to have a better uh, transportation system. Great. Thanks, Kyle. Um, we got a question as well from Robert Pinkney. Um, Robert was wondering about the COVID numbers in the U.S. They're very concerning. What are your thoughts on the U.S.-Canada border? I think the government's made the absolute right decision uh, to keep the border closed now. I think they've just announced that it's to uh, uh, August 21st. Uh, the COVID numbers in the U.S. are staggering, uh, and we're seeing those those numbers uh, seemingly increase every single day. And I think, you know, that's the danger of trying to uh, reopen uh, the economy too soon. Uh, it's the danger of people uh, choosing to uh, congregate closely together uh, when we were supposed to be social distancing. We've got to keep the border closed. Uh, I don't know for how long, um, but I think until we see uh, US COVID numbers going down, uh, the border is going to have to be closed uh, to non-essential travel. So when we say the border is closed, it's actually just closed to non-essential travel. Goods uh, can still flow across the border. Uh, and if you have essential travel, uh, you can uh, go across the border as well. But the general person wanting to go back and forth across the border, uh, they cannot do that. Uh, and I don't know when the U.S. numbers are going to go down. They seem to be, you know, our curve is flattening. I think we announced today in Ontario, it was announced that we had 108 new cases in the entire province. 
you know, there are um, some states in the U.S. that uh, have 17,000 new cases a day. I think, I think Florida was somewhere around there. Um, if they can't get it under control, then I think the border is going to have to remain uh, closed to non-essential travel. Otherwise, we're putting at risk all the hard work we've done here uh, in Canada. So um, the government has really done a good job in getting the COVID-19 numbers to go down with the approach they've taken. So I certainly give credit where credit's due to the government and uh, they, they've done a good job and in, in the plan has worked. We are uh, really, really, really uh, flattening that curve. Great, thanks Kyle. Um, in the chat as well, we got a message from Andrea. Um, she w wants uh, to know how you will improve Bolton um, as opposed to providing criticisms. Um, and I also see now that the mayor is on the line, so I don't know if we want to also pass that over to you, Mayor Thompson, if you have some input on that as well. Kyle, I'll let you go first so we can get sure. there. Well, I'm, I'm glad that Mayor Thompson, we got you uh, into the call. I apologize uh, for the technical difficulties that have uh, kept you out of the call. If you want to uh, make some uh, opening remarks, uh, that would be great. And then I, I'm, I'm uh, what I will say to, uh, to Andrea, who's answered it, who's put in this question, um, I think dealing with a, a particular, a particular uh, part of Caledon and a, a business improvement area, those are issues that uh, are best decided by local and municipal politicians. Uh, where I think the federal government has a role is to partner uh, with municipalities if they want to try and have a business improvement area, uh, provide some funding for that. Um, I do criticize the government for the rollout on businesses because I think it, they did a poor job and businesses have suffered. I, I try and call things like I see them. I think they've done a great job in reducing the COVID-19 numbers with their approach, but conversely, I don't think they did a great job in protecting our businesses. And that's why I think it's gonna be challenging uh, to not only uh, attract new businesses, not just in Bolton, but all across this country. Um, uh, and it's gonna be challenging to, uh, to keep the businesses that we have uh, through COVID-19, which is why I'm saying we need a recovery plan uh, from the federal government as we transition uh, back to a normal economy. And uh, turn it over to you, Alan, if you're there. No, thank you, Kyle. And uh, th thank you very much for having us on. And I'm sorry I've got into technical glitches. I got myself locked out. So I had to get my, one of my admin assistant to get in on her thing. So I don't know what's happened. I've been using Zoom all week, but it's given up the ghost for me tonight. So anyway, thank you for being patient. But Bolton is definitely uh, an important thing and uh, bringing back all day parking is one is we were having a huge problem with traffic down there. Uh, if you don't change something after 20 years, then you're not, it's never going to fix itself. Uh, another challenge is we have some absentee landowners. So this vacancy discount has got to stop. I think we have to get them to, you know, make them competitive to want to get out and rent these facilities out so that we can get uh, vendors in. Uh, another thing I totally agree with you, Kyle, uh, the business approach, we need business people to really understand what the businesses are going through. Uh, Councillor Rosa, along with Councillor Groves, but Councillor Rosa is taking the lead. Uh, we have a, a revitalization committee underway. We've done a number of studies. You know, there's a lot of things that we can do as a town and uh, enough talking, enough studies. Let's just, we got a plan, just let's put implement it, get it into place. The CIP has definitely helped the downtown core, but we got to still, um, you know, it, it, it's going to take time, but especially COVID sure hasn't helped. My concern is uh, one thing is red tape uh, processes uh, as far as opening up uh, for restaurants, being able to have uh, patios and different things before it all, you always had to go through committee of adjustment, a lot of that. So the province is relaxed a lot of the processes so it's given us under the COVID emergency act we can do a lot of those things to help businesses get underway um, we need everybody to wear masks at this point because it's we cannot afford to shut the municipality and our businesses down again so we're going to have to implement practices such as masks face shields whatever wear something so you're protecting yourself and protecting others so it's just those things that we're doing um, but we're all gonna to have to work together. It just can't be the municipality. We need yeah. yourself, Kyle. We also need Sylvia Jones. We all need to work together and uh, work with the business community to find that. 
And uh, hopefully the chamber's looking to revitalize itself. It's got to move quickly to get things going. We really, at the time we needed the chamber and we don't have one, it's been really difficult. Uh, Shauna, I, I, see a, I see a quick question in the chat. I'm gonna uh, take over your job for a second. Uh, I see another uh, question here from uh, Andrea. She's saying, what about uh, the, commercial, uh, the commercial rent subsidy? Tenants are only having to pay 25% uh, rent if they apply. Um, it's actually not the tenant uh, that's able to apply for uh, the commercial rent subsidy. And that's also been one of the criticisms that I made of the government in their uh, rollout to support uh, businesses. Uh, the landlord has to apply. Uh, and if the landlord does not apply, um, then the tenant has no way to access those funds. And there are some landlords who are choosing not to apply uh, and they are uh, asking their tenants to pay the full rent. Uh, I have uh, said this very, uh, very publicly that uh, landlords who are who are doing this and uh, not working with their tenants to provide them with some rent relief when they've been ordered by the government to shut down their business uh, are not behaving in a way that I consider to be very Canadian. And uh, I urge them to reconsider that approach. Uh, I've heard from landlords who tell me that it's not a great process to apply for uh, the commercial rent subsidy uh, uh, that then gets passed on to the tenants. Uh, they're upset about how it's been structured, the amount of information they have to give to the government, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So again, I think um, the rollout of that program was a little too complicated and uh, not made available to tenants. Great, thanks Kyle. Um, Mayor Thompson, now while we have you on the line, I do have a few municipal questions that were submitted originally. Sure. Um, I see that Carol Ann is on the call and Carol Ann had some questions uh, with regards to garbage cans in the area. Um, so I'm going to ask technical support if they're able to unmute Carol Ann and then uh, she can address that question to you. Sure. Hi there. Hi Carol, how are you? Oh, not too bad. Um, yeah, I'm just, as I walk my dog around the blocks and stuff like that, and I know my park that's right here, there's no garbage cans in order to dump the dog poop, right? And I'm noticing when I walk the dog, and I see so many people don't pick up after, them, after their dogs, and I think that if there was a garbage can, maybe that might be more incentive for people to pick it up and put it in there, because they don't want to walk around the block with the bag of poop. <laughs> Have you reached out to your counselors on that at all, Carol Ann? No. Okay. They're well, no, you know what? But, you know, you've got a very valid point, And to me, that's an easy fix. So I'm going to be talking to Public Works tomorrow to see what we can do to get something installed for the mm -hmm. Goodfellow Park to see what we can do for that. Okay? Yeah, I'm, sure, I'm not I sure. I think it's yeah. a logical ask. Yeah. You know, definitely this one. And then there was really some nasty ones in there, too. So... And, you know, even when you have the garbage can, you know, it's just, I, I don't know what it is with some people. They just won't do anything about it. But, you know, let's get it there so it creates an environment for people to do it. So, absolutely. Yeah, I think it at least give a little bit of incentive, right? For sure. For sure. So well, thank you for your question. Thank you. Thank you. So, Kyle, there's also another comment in the chat from Susan. Um, Susan mentioned that due to the numbers of COVID in the U.S., why are flights still being permitted to enter Canada? From the news today, it was indicated that over 20,000 passengers were flagged as a risk of not self-isolating, but nothing was done to follow up. Do you have any information on that? I don't, and uh, I, I read those news reports myself over the last couple of days. It's, it's very disturbing. Uh, that people who are uh, at um, who are so when you come into Canada uh, you have to self-isolate for 14 days uh, and if you're not self-isolating you are putting people at risk you may not have COVID but you may and especially given the numbers that we're seeing down in the United States um, I think the government absolutely has to do something about this uh, in countries that have been incredibly successful more successful than ourselves whether that was uh, New Zealand uh, or if we look at uh, Taiwan, uh, they were very strict in the implication in the uh, um, implementation of these protocols. Uh, they tracked people who were coming in. Uh, they required them to self-isolate. Uh, they would put trackers on their cell phones and say, "You are required to self-isolate." And then, if they saw those people uh, with those trackers not self-isolating, those people uh, were in trouble. And 
I think we're having so much success right now in getting these numbers down that we cannot risk it uh, by not taking an aggressive approach for people who are traveling into the country. Uh, so uh, this is absolutely an issue that uh, needs to be brought up with the government. Uh, it's disappointing that uh, we don't have parliament sitting right now. That was a decision by the current government uh, to continue to have parliament suspended. Uh, they did that uh, with the support of the NDP party. Uh, I think that, and we have been, I, I've been very clear on this, uh, I think that if uh, we can express, expect uh, people working in grocery stores uh, to be working during COVID-19, uh, we can expect a member of parliament uh, with a reduced quorum where you can socially distance. There's room to have about 75 or 80 members in the House of Commons appropriately social distanced and wearing a mask. We could have parliament and we could be asking these kinds of questions and dealing with other issues for Canadians. And I've been incredibly disappointed uh, that the government, uh, with, with the help of uh, the NDP, decided that we would not have Parliament sit. And I've had people uh, message me about this. Why aren't you sitting? Everybody else is working. Well, believe me, uh, I want to be. I'm, I'm actually here in Ottawa right now and uh, in my office here. And, and uh, I, wish we had, uh, I wish we had Parliament tomorrow. Thanks, Kyle. Uh, I think this will be the last question we take here because it's uh, nearing eight o'clock, but I noticed also that Jane was on the line and uh, Jane had a question also about public transport in Bolton, transportation in Bolton. Kyle already touched on that, Mayor Thompson, but is there anything yeah. that you would like to add on that? We do have a public trans, uh, trans system now underway. Um, it's, you know, constantly a uh, work improvement. COVID is really throwing a wrench in the gears as far as developing it. But uh, this is something that is here to stay. It's something that we're developing and uh, hopefully we can have better use. Another thing that we're definitely working on with the city of Vaughan as well is getting go into uh, just north of Bolton there uh, on Humber Station Road and uh, trying to get those lands protected. Uh, the city of Vaughan needs it so that they can have their stops. The only place we can park the trains is, is the Bolton area. But uh, I mean, for it's really uh, Caledon Go is really what it's called because it's for the Caledon area and we're gonna need a sizable parking lot, which we can do to allow people to come off the, uh, you know, the, uh, the Emilco Parkway, as well as other areas to get cars off the road, especially Highway 50, the 427 is gonna take years to get built. And uh, so it's extremely important that we gotta find other ways of modes of transportation. And I think this is something that's extremely important going forward. So yeah, we're looking at every angle we can possibly do to see how we can move people. I know we had a real challenge with uh, even the GO bus uh, being uh, discontinued and uh, we're, we're working constantly with that to, uh, to enhance that, to get better times for people to get connected to certain areas and also on how to get on the TTC, even out at the Vaughan station. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of work underway and a lot of dialogue, but it's, uh, you know, as the residents say, well, when's it happening? And that's the other thing I was kind of hoping, you know, this summer, this fall, we'd have a lot done. But again, as we all know, COVID is really putting a wrench in the gears as far as finding those solutions, but we're going to get there. And, uh, and Mayor Thompson, when I was asked the question, I, I said that this is something that all three levels of government have to be prepared Absolutely. to partner, uh, especially with respect to funding. I don't believe there's a federal government role in determining where GO Transit should be or where the transportation network should be. We should be the partner that is providing funding uh, to, the, to the province and the municipalities for whatever, whatever those priorities are. And Kyle, I totally agree with you. I think we're the only, uh, what, you know, of the G7, we're the only nation that the federal government doesn't contribute to transit, you know, for moving people. And that, that's something that's a, a spellbinding. You know, in the U.S., it's, you know, it's all either federal or state that runs it. Here, it's the local municipalities. And we don't have the, uh, the finances to uh, maneuver to that. Like, Toronto is even struggling. So uh, I think John Tory was offered a, a, a gift, and he didn't take it. But I really think it should be a provincial federal responsibility, help the minister, and this is where the municipality step up, is help minister and deliver the local service. But it's, it, you're right, it has to be a three-way or we're not going to be able to deliver what the residents are looking for, and that's why our roads are impacted. Yeah, and, and, and as I said earlier, transit is, is such a key to quality of life, 
Uh, and it's also key to us meeting uh, our carbon emission reduction goals uh, all, all across this country. When we're you know, sitting in our cars, uh, uh, like a parking lot on the 410, you know, we are massively contributing to, uh, to uh, climate change uh, and increased greenhouse gas emissions. So we have to, we have to find ways to fix it. Um, Shauna, I do actually, uh, I do see another question here. We started a little bit late. Uh, so I think um, I'm going to, I'm going to grab one question that I see that was submitted here. Uh, and uh, if you're uh, Mayor Thompson, if you're willing to st stay on a little bit more, sure, absolutely, uh, we could jump into uh, one of the other municipal ones. Um, so this is also this is actually from uh, from Andrea Tong as well. Uh, and you know, Andrea said, uh, "I'd like you to discuss how you'd be representing the voice of Bolton, uh, even if our voice isn't in line with your party's policies." So uh, one of the things that I've always talked about when being a member of parliament is that I want to be uh, the voice of my community. And there's lots of, lots of ways to do that. Having town halls are one way. I try to find out what my constituents feel on certain issues and, and how they would like me to vote. Uh, in, in the government of Canada, uh, in, in, in most political parties, there are certain things that uh, you're required to vote in favor of. Uh, those are things like the budget, uh, and, you know, key policies of your party. Uh, but on anything that doesn't touch on that, uh, my belief is that I have to vote the way my constituents want uh, on those particular issues. So, uh, Andrea, I would encourage you, if you have issues that uh, you would like to see me vote a certain way, please get in touch with me, uh, have others do that, because that's the way that I inform myself on uh, how I should be voting on certain issues. It's also one of the reasons why I committed in my campaign to have these town hall meetings uh, four times a year, because that's really the way that you're going to be able to get in touch uh, with your constituents and find out how they feel about certain issues. Shauna, do you have uh, one that we can uh, talk about on the uh, a municipal issue uh, for Mayor Thompson? Um, I think we got through most of them. I'm just trying to see also if there's anyone on the line that asked a question that I didn't give the opportunity to speak. Um, we did have another municipal question, Mayor Thompson, from constituent Jazz Winder, um, and they were wondering about any future development plans in the area that you could advise on, if there's anything in... Sure. Uh, so, uh, yes, uh, we've, we've got a number of things on the go. Uh, right now, uh, with Bolton, uh, we're you know going through a board hearing to do some expansion there. There's uh, development taking place in Caledon East. Uh, we have development taking place in Mayfield West as well. Uh, we also have uh, small communities like Alton and Bell Fountain with small developments taking place there. But also, when you talk about development, what of? And we have, do have a lot of employment taking place in Mayfield West as well as the Bolton area. Um, and hopefully we'll get it in Victoria and Tullamore as well. We have, do have a plan that we're trying to work with MTO for the Victoria uh, Business Park over there. Um, but also the other development I call to is uh, getting the infrastructure in, especially with broadband, and through the SWIFT initiative, which uh, helps subsidize to get rural connections done like the urban centers. Uh, we, we, we have closed the RFP. We're going through the uh, tenders right now. We hope to have something within the next six weeks um, to say where and how we're gonna get this started. And looking at the projects, we've got about uh, 5.2 million of funding that we have combined between what the town's put forward, the federal and provincial government, but also with the federal government, uh, other programs have, they've just introduced with the, uh, also with the 150 million that uh, the provincial government has uh, maybe we can tap in to help get the rest of our community connected. Um, SWIFT is also looking at 2.0, which is the next phase. And uh, we're hoping to get at least 95% of Southwestern Ontario covered with that funding. But uh, what we're looking at is 10% of that funding because it's 10% of the population. And uh, Kyle, we can, hopefully we can have your support on that because it's not just for Caledon, but it's for all of Southwestern Ontario from Muskoka, basically, right to the Great Lakes. So this is something that's extremely important, but it's one way of getting our kids the education that they need at work, uh, especially people working from home. 
I think that's going to be more of a lifestyle change, especially with COVID. But it isn't about downloading Netflix anymore. What it's about is having to survive at home, operate your business, also getting our kids educated, uh, especially with telehealth and everything that's required. This is a new era that we're walking into. There's going to be a new norm. And part of that is we've got to have fiber to the door. Uh, we've definitely watched how the cell towers are uh, completely failed for us here in Caledon. Um, you know, they're oversubscribed some places as high as 1,500%, which is uncalled for, uh, which has caused huge failure for our 911 calls, which is public safety. So I think at this point, I'm not pointing the fingers at Rogers and Bell and all the providers. Let's all work together to find solutions to get our community served the best way, the quickest way we know how. Yeah, I, yeah I agree. Um, absolutely. Uh, Mayor Thompson, what is the, when, when is a Mayfield West supposed to start? I know I thought it was coming up this year, but um, is it is. That yeah, so registration's done. So you'll see the uh, sales uh, pavilion, the infrastructure is going in now. Uh, the sewers and storm sewers and everything are being put in the ground uh, as of this week. So uh, you will be seeing uh, sales pavilions opening up any day and uh, they're going to do it. Uh, I know we're going to be having a bit of a groundbreaking the uh, end of uh, August for that area. And uh, Kyle, I uh, hope you can be part of that as well. Uh, one thing we're going to be celebrating in the Mayfield West, which is between Highway, um, Highway 10 and over west towards uh, Chincuzi Road, and that first phase, it's, we're going to have ubiquitous Wi-Fi. So it, what it means is that uh, it's, it's deemed as the first smart community in Ontario and one of the first in Canada. I know some of it's being done in BC as we speak. But uh, this is where you're going to have ubiquitous Wi-Fi from your street lights. So kids don't even, even need a cell phone plan go to school, uh, it's gonna be completely connected. So when you even buy a new home, it isn't about pecking the countertop or you know, the trims that you're having in the house, but it's also what kind of security system and uh, you know, what kind of style of Amazon, I call it the Amazon door where your parcel comes and that you know, it reads the barcode and you can slip it through the door or, or a piece in the wall. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a new smart communities. It's being done all the time and around the world. And uh, it's about time Canada catches up. And with Bill and Rogers, to so both come to be the major, uh, major providers. Um, so this is something that we're all going to celebrate. And uh, stay tuned. It's going to get interesting in the next few weeks. Great. Um, just as on one final note, Mayor Thompson, there's a comment in the chat section uh, from Jennifer uh, wondering if there's any community come together events planned at this point, uh, taking COVID into account, uh, but is there any movie nights in the field, drive-ins, theaters, anything the town's thinking about to maybe boost some community spirit? We've had a lot of uh, talks on where we want to go. We have to work with them, uh, our uh, medical health officer of health for the uh, region appeal. And at this point, until we can get the COVID numbers in a safe place, you know, less than 10 in Peel. It's gonna be very difficult to do that. I, I wish we could, um, you know, we really miss Caledon Day. We've missed a lot of events to bring people together. And I think we need to find ways to bring our community together. And I think it's gonna to have to be this fall, but we need to, we need to heal as a community and how we go about that. And uh, as much as what Jennifer's asking for, I totally agree with her. Uh, you know, maybe even with the Bolton camp, we can do something again, but it's how we can get people to do it safely and the social distancing. Uh, we're going to have to get figure out how, you know, to do that, to control the, the impact of the second wave that can come so our kids can go to school. We're going to have to find ways to wear masks or face shields or just how to, it's just going to be a different way of living till we have vaccines or whatever. So the next couple of years, it's going to be a long drawn affair. And I, I, Listen, I know it more than anything. My daughter had to cancel her wedding for this September, so it's next year, hopefully. But um, I think we're we're it, this is going to be a whole new norm for all of us. So it it's been an emotional roller coaster for a lot of people. But Jen, I totally agree with you. Um, we need to do something. But until the our medical uh, chief medical officer of health can say yes, we can. Um, it's going to be a tough one. But when we do, 
I hope we can call on you and a lot of you that are on the call tonight to be part of that to help make this possible because I think we need these things to help our community come together because we've got a great community at Caledon. Absolutely. Great. Well, I think that might be a good place to end it there on a bit of a positive note. So thank you everyone for participating in this evening's virtual town hall. Um, if you are unable to get a question answered by the mayor or Kyle, uh, please feel free to forward them on to us both via email. Kyle's email is kyle.seback at parl.gc.ca. And the mayor is, I believe, mayor at caledon.ca. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and I'm sure they That's both will be able to answer any future questions. Um, and then we would like to invite everyone to provide us with some feedback from this evening's event. Um, if you follow the link www.kylesebach.ca slash Bolton, it's the same link that you would have used to sign up for tonight's event. It's now turned into a comment card where you can leave us some feedback, which will help us in the organization of future events. Um, I'll pass it over to Kyle now for some quick closing remarks. I think you covered it all. Uh, thanks everyone for joining in tonight. And yes, again, if uh, you do have a question you weren't uh, able to get an answer to, please send me an email. If you do have any issues with the federal government, uh, my office is, and myself, we're always there to serve you. That could be anything to do with uh, Canada Revenue Agency, uh, um, passports, uh, you name it. Anything the federal government does, uh, we're here to help. And uh, please uh, get in touch with our office, okay? Great. Thanks, everyone. I believe technical support will now be ending the call, but thank you again for your participation. Thank you. Thank you, Kyle.